So today my guest is Ryan Hoover. Ryan is the founder of Product Hunt, ProductHunt.co, which is a site for discovering new products like mobile apps, websites, hardware projects, and tech creations updated daily and curated by the Product Hunt members. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, how's it going, Felix? Good. So, so you know, you obviously have a you know a ton of success right now with uh, you know the recent round that you raised, and uh, just over the past year, I've heard so much about product hunt and the things that you're doing. But I kind of want to wind the clock back a little bit to the very beginning, where you first kind of started your startup life as a product manager, where you were director of product at Playhaven. So, what was the what was Playhaven, and what were you guys doing over there? Yeah. Well, actually, if you go back a little bit further, I was uh, my first role in product manager was at a previous company right before that. It was called Instant Action, and it was in the PC gaming space. I actually kind of fell into the role. Um, I was doing marketing straight out of college, and then my boss was a VP of product. And uh, so, long story short, I ended up you know moving into product management, learning on the job. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing if I look back on what I was actually doing, and learned along the way. So. From there, I joined Playhaven. Uh, I was the first PM there for maybe a year and a half. I was the only PM, I want to say. And and then same thing, just kind of learn on the job. So, you know, college doesn't, my college, and, and most really don't provide direct kind of education or guidance on product management because it's somewhat of a vague <laughs> role, and, and it varies by company. So, you know, that that's how I learned is just, you know, getting an opportunity, fortunately, in uh in the actual role itself. Yeah, that, that seems to happen a lot where people kind of just fall into this role because like you're saying, there's really no track to get to a product management job uh, using the kind of traditional way of going to school for the a particular you know concentration or major and then coming out and getting a product management job. It's not it's not that straightforward. Uh, so you know, once you first got that uh, transition to product management, how did you get the second job at Playhaven? What were they? What were you uh, you know doing kind of to market yourself and get a position as a product manager at a different company? Yeah, so I was fortunate in that I, I transitioned from instant action to to Playhaven and the C, C, um, what was he? COO, actually, Andy Yang, was, uh, he joined Playhaven. So I worked with him at the previous company, and that's how we got connected. And, you know, he knew that I, I had this interest and in, in this talent in the product management space, so he, he gave me a shot. Um, you know, I was still pretty green. I think I was only a PM for about a year before I moved to, to Playhaven, and he took a chance on me, and super fortunate for that. So, you know, really, it's just like most businesses, there's also an element of connections and relationships that you build. And it's really a testament to how important it is to treat people fairly and good and build relationships in the network. And that's that's how I got my, my role at, at Playhaven, really. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, when you first got the the role at Playhaven, what were some skills that you think that you that were very that is very important for a product manager to have that you had to kind of develop on the job? Hmm. I, I think there's a number of them. I think part of it is empathy. It is a recurring theme that probably every single PM would, would say at some point is just understanding how do you, how do you understand what people want and, and how they feel and how they react to things and having some empathy for other people. It's really important, especially if you're building a product for someone else. So at, at Playhaven, it was in the mobile gaming space and, and we were building tools for mobile game developers. And, you know, I was not a mobile game developer. I'm not today. And so for me, I had to really understand, okay, what, what, are they, what is their day-to-day like? What challenges they have? How are they being measured? Um, and you really find that, that stuff out by observing behavior and talking to mobile game developers. And so empathy is, is kind of a recurring theme and something that you just need to, to understand and, and have an appreciation for. And to go along with that, you kind of have to be humble in a way, too. You have to, to also realize that your assumption is probably not correct, um, <laughs> as confident as you are. So it's good to have confidence, but also to verify those assumptions and talk to customers and look at data to understand that, you know, are you actually building something that people want? Yeah, that makes sense. And what was your like, day-to-day like? I know you're saying that you spend a lot of time uh, actually talking and observing the, the, the customers. Does that mean that you are going to their offices every day? Or, you know, what does your, your day-to-day consist of? Uh, yeah, at Play Even, it was, yeah, it was a combination of many different things. Part of it was... Part of it, frankly, is intuition. So it's actually not talking to customers because you can't you can't talk to them about every single thing. So you have to have some intuition on how this interface should look and how it should work. So 
there's that piece, but then in terms of getting actual quantifiable data, there's looking at the metrics, what pieces of the product are people using is, is one piece of it. So over time in our product, we had this dashboard with many different features. And something that, that we did do at one point is we just looked at, okay, what are people actually using? You know, which tools are they using out of these 10 that we created? And that gives you an understanding of, okay, why are they not using these other two tools? Is it because they have no use for it? Is it because it's too confusing? Is it because they can't measure the output and therefore they won't use it? So you start building these hypotheses around why they're using some things and why they're not using others. And you can take that information with you when you go talk to customers. So I would go to like big companies and small companies, like Glue Mobile, for example. We would go to their office and talk with some of their VPs and some of their producers directly about Playhaven and also about you know their their own personal goals and what they're trying to achieve. I would also talk on the phone with some indie game developers, some guys that are like literally a, a guy in the garage <laughs> building a game. So you kind of get a, a variety of opinions and perspectives. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of yeah, just data and, and qualitative feedback right. that you get. I see what you're saying. So you you first do the research, do the data, uh, you know, at, at in the in your office, and then go out and talk to the customers to help kind of validate those assumptions that you came up with based on the data, and also just kind of give you context when you're having the conversation, so that you're not you know unaware of how they use it, but which you can you know easily get by looking at the data. So what what other tools do exactly. you use um, for for you to do your job as a product manager? Um. Let me think here. So we, we had an internal tool that we used for looking at data and doing some data analysis that we used at Playhaven. And then we used some project management tools. Um, at one point, we were using Pivotal, and then we, we grew to a pretty large size team, so we moved to Jira. So we used kind of the standard tools in that sense. Um, you know, there's I haven't found any particular eclectic tools that other people don't use uh, that have been super valuable. I mean, we use... Gmail, we use Google Docs, we use um, pen and paper. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pen and paper whiteboards are oftentimes the best thing for collaboration and, and that kind of thing. Um, so nothing nothing too surprising, honestly. If you find any, I mean, if you know of any cool product management tools, let me know because uh, mm -hmm. I haven't found anything that's been demonstrably um, impactful in making my job easier. Yeah, it seems like there are some kind of new tools that are coming out there that are almost like specialized for the entire product management job. I'm not, not sure how, how well they're playing out yet, um, but it does seem like there's some interest in the space of making the job for a product manager easier. Were you using any for any uh, tools for like wireframing or any apps for that? Yeah, I personally like OmniGraffle, and I know it's not the most popular tool, but I've just become really familiar with it and I know the shortcuts and I have stencils and for me I can wireframe things pretty quickly in OmniGraffle. Other people use Balsamic. Um, some go straight into Sketch and others. Uh, so I use that. I I also will force myself to avoid any digital tools like that for wireframing though and I go straight to whiteboard or, or post-it notes and for that it, it makes it easier to sketch out ideas faster and it since it's so constrained and since you can't change or edit your pen, it, it forces you to be very succinct and, and quick in sketching out your ideas. Um, one mistake I've made is I, I will use something like OmniGraffle and I will, for whatever reason, start being pixel perfect in my wireframes. Mm -hmm. And for some things, when it's early on, it's just a waste of time. Right. But I'm such a perfectionist that I will just spend this, this extra time uh, you know, aligning things correctly when really it's not important. Yeah, sometimes tools can definitely consume your your time when when you don't when it's not really moving the needle. So you know, like you're saying before, uh, there is a lot of um, collaboration when it comes to things like uh, you know working as a product manager, and then also while you're doing things like wireframing, you know, you need designers or other folks in the room. You know, what was the team like that you're working with, and what kind of roles did they have, and how did you work with them? You know, so this is actually something that people need to be aware of that maybe aren't in a product management role or maybe not in startups is that first off, product management role varies by company, but it also varies by team size. When I joined Playhaven, we were around 10 people or so, and it was just me and a bunch of engineers for the most part. We didn't have a designer. Um, well, we actually had a visual designer at one point, but you know, it, it was me doing the wireframes and UX and everything along with the general product management role. And then we grew and we grew to 100 people and we started building out multiple product management teams. We had a UX designer, a visual designer, and that certainly changed the way that we worked because now we had more resources to build out um, 
more fully fledged features, you know, and do more research. Uh, whereas before, it was just me making some some quick wireframes, engineers building it, and you know, there's pros and cons to both approaches. The pro is that you can move relatively fast with few resources, few people, but you may not be coming out with the best product because you have someone like myself doing, you know, all the work when it comes to UX when, you know, a professional that, that does this full time for a living could probably come out with something better. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it really varies in that you kind of have to adapt to those different roles. Like when, when you're in the beginning and you're just building wireframes as a PM and, and you're working with a small team, it's pretty loose and there's relatively uh, usually very little process, and that's a good thing. But then when you're bigger, you, you need more process, and you have to plan ahead more. You have to communicate with a lot more people. Like Communication is the, probably the most important skill set for a product manager, being able to talk with a lot of people, and, and that gets back to empathy. Being able to empathize with an engineer and with a designer uh, is really important to building a, a good team, but also making sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, it's going to jump to that next. Um, you know, once you're when you're kind of a smaller team, the communication issues that you might have aren't really enlarged. You know, they're not that that serious, I guess, because the team is so small that you guys can hear each other's conversations. But once it grows to 100 people or more, uh, those communication kind of issues that you might not have worked out earlier then really start to show themselves. What would you have like a, a if you could give like a, a tip or number one tip that you have for working with like let's say developers and engineers. Uh, uh, what would it be? I would say, hmm, number one tip. I would say, um, I guess, uh, err on too much communication rather than under communicating. Mm -hmm. You don't want to. So the one thing that that people that are not familiar with with product management or maybe not familiar with engineering that they make this mistake. They go up to an engineer and they say, "Hey, can you build this thing? Can you add this thing?" Like this happening. I mean, they they don't have this empathy or this understanding that. They have a lot of other things going on. When you talk to an engineer, a lot of times their head is in a different place, and you immediately break this, this spider web of code that's in your head when you interrupt them. And then you can also really frustrate people when you're like, okay, here's this new thing, can you build it? And you don't think ahead. So as a team gets bigger, you want to kind of have some, some level of communication and a process to that and understanding that, you know, it might seem easy, and it might be easy, but don't just throw things on engineers. Like you got to give them some warning um, to an extent if you can. Uh, same thing for designers, but I feel like it's even more prevalent with engineers the way that they they operate and the way that they typically like to work. Right, that makes sense. And what about when you go talk to clients? Like, what are some kind of tips or things that you keep in mind when you go and you know talk to them? Do you do you like do things like conduct customer interviews, or do you do like testing or anything with with uh, with your um, your customers when you go meet them in person? Uh, it varies. It depends on what we're focusing on. Sometimes we're exploring new product ideas, new feature ideas, and we start with not, here's this cool idea, you, aren't you going to love it? <laughs> That's a bad way of mm -hmm. trying to understand what they actually need. But we do start exploring questions around that space. Uh, an example could be, you know, we have a prompt idea that will increase engagement. And so we might start asking questions about that. Like, how do you measure engagement? Or how are, how are users currently engaging with their products and start pulling out some themes. Then maybe towards the end of that conversation, you start talking more specifically about, okay, here's this, this thing I have, this idea we have, this feature. Maybe we'll show them wireframes. Maybe we'll show them a prototype. Uh, maybe we'll have them just play with it, and we'll sit back and watch and see what they do. So it kind of varies. Um, usability tests are really helpful at some point. You don't want to introduce them too early in a conversation like that. But when you get to that stage, having them just use a product and having them struggle with it, because that, that's inevitably going to happen, most likely. Uh, and it's super painful, <laughs> but you'll learn a lot when you see them playing with your actual prototype or your product. Yeah, and then once you know the product is is built, uh, do you have any kind of recommendations or any uh, you know rules of thumb or any um, strategies for making sure that a, a new product release is you know launched successfully? Uh, so it's, that can fit within the role of a product manager. And, uh, sometimes, not always. Sometimes it's kind of the role of a product mar marketing manager mm -hmm. um, or just marketing team in general. Um, it It's such a contextual question. It really depends on what you're building. Are you building a new feature for an existing audience? Or are you building a brand new product? 
and so the approach would be completely different. I think, so yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to an answer that without having a certain frame or context. If it's, let's say, an existing feature, then or to an, a feature to an existing audience, like let's say at Playhaven when we release a new tool, then for us it's communicating, okay, here's what this tool is, here's what it does, here's why it's important and why you, and you communicating along with, you know, what their goals are, why it will help them do better in their job. That's communicated through email, it's communicated through the actual product itself, you know, on the dashboard, let's say. Um, it's also communicated throughout the company because at Playhaven we had a team of account managers and salespeople too. So it's important for them to understand this is what it does, here's how you communicate externally, you know, and they can then do the sales and education um, of new features. That makes sense. So, you know, when you are um, when you are a director there, I'm sure you've came across a lot of um, product manager applicants and folks that wanted to get into to the role. Um, if you, when you're interviewing someone for for a product manager job, what are some things that they that that you've seen um, applicants come through with that kind of blew you away and made you think this is the perfect person to join our team? Yeah, it's. It's a hard one. I mean, I guess it's, it's kind of hard for any role. I mean, we're we're hiring also at Product Hunt right now, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the best candidates are people I've already worked with and that I know are good. Otherwise, it's through referrals, oftentimes. So at Product or Playhaven, rather, that was similar. A lot of the hires that we got were through referrals or people that had worked with them before. And actually, a lot of the people from Instant Action, the previous company I was with, joined uh, Playhaven early on. So I think maybe we might have recruited eight or ten people from from international at one point. Um, when I do see someone that I don't know or doesn't have a referral necessarily, I I typically look at what what have they actually done, and I will also stalk them online. I mean, I'll look in, on Twitter. What are they talking about on Twitter? If they're on there, have, if they have a blog. What are they writing about? Mm. I I've written about this before, but blogging is is one of many different ways to frame yourself, but also communicate your ideas and. Since a product manager doesn't necessarily do design, it doesn't, they don't do code, they don't have like a GitHub profile you can point to, blog is a really good way to communicate how you think about things, how you think about yeah. products. Yeah, what are some other so ways that's, that, that's the thing I look at. Sorry, what, what are some other ways they can do that? Because I know you did write a short blog post called uh, Anyone Can Ship, and it's about creating side projects and how you don't need to be a technical or a designer or a coder to create a side project. Um, you know, what are some things, mm -hmm. other things that an aspiring product manager can do outside of work uh, with a side project to look attractive to a hiring company? Yeah, I, I'm very, I encourage people to do side products, uh, and you can you can do many different things, of course. It could be uh, an email newsletter. That's how Product Hunt actually started. It could be meetups. You know, you could organize meetups in your city um, around startups or maybe some other uh, category of interest. Uh, it could be a podcast. There's many different ways of uh, effectively trying to create value in some way. Mm -hmm. and Or it could be a product itself. Maybe, maybe you have this cool product idea and you just want to try it out. And that's actually a good way of getting into product management. If you have no opportunity to get a role in, in as a PM, which is really hard to do if you don't have experience, one way is just to build some sort of product on the side. And what you're doing by that is demonstrating your product sense, your ability to execute. And, uh, you know, there's no reason that, that you shouldn't start something like that. Um, yeah. You don't necessarily need the code to, to do that. Um, you know, figure out how do, you, how do you build something simply and how do you start measuring and getting some feedback on whether people care about this thing. And yeah. oftentimes, it doesn't require code in the beginning. Right, that makes sense. And I've seen some people go to the lengths of uh, you know, uh, taking their idea that they have and just you know hiring freelancers to to build it for them because I, I think that kind of shows your ability to manage resources. You know, because because it's your own money, your own time that you have put into it. And if you you know show that you can deliver something that has a value and that you were able to manage that entire process, manage another the developer or maybe a couple of developers and manage like the resource, I think it speaks a lot of volumes about the kind of performance that you can have on the job. So I've seen some cool stuff like that mm -hmm. happen too. And you also actually wrote another yeah. blog post that I liked that was, I think it was right after you made the jump uh, outside of Playhaven and you were questioning whether you should learn how to code because it seems like such a big you know, kind of um, movement right now. And you kind of mm -hmm. settled on the idea that you shouldn't because there's the opportunity cost that affects you because you could be spending your time doing something more valuable that more and more impactful for, you know, for your life. 
Um, but in general, the question I have is like, do you need to be technical or how technical do you need to be uh, to be a product manager? Yeah. Um, it's kind of like, a, unfortunately, a lot of my answers is, is it depends. <laughs> some some roles as a PM, you need to be an engineer to be able to communicate what you're building. Mm-hmm. And that's just a requirement. Others, you need to be more maybe design-centric. You may not have to be technical at all, but you need to be very conscientious of like UX and, and how people think. Um, so it heavily varies, uh, honestly. It depends on kind of what type of company you want to join. Yeah, so, so one last question I think that is uh, kind of in the minds of a lot of uh, aspiring product managers when they look out in their career like five years down the line is, uh, you know, now, now that you've kind of found and recently raised a Series A investment round of Product Hunt and things are going really well for you at your new startup, do you find that you rely on your product management skills that you picked up on at Playhaven in previous roles a lot and which skills specifically? Yeah, I think it's it's hard for me to articulate the exact skills sometimes. I think it's part of it is over time you start learning how to speak with designers and, and developers. You start working with more of them. Some people just operate differently, so it gets back to human empathy and, and having a an understanding of how people work. So there's kind of the people soft skills that you learn. There's the hard skills in terms of like how do you look at data and what should you measure. Um, I... I wish I had a better way of articulating like the, the the five skills or something that you should you should have as a, a product manager. But um, you know, it's just a lot of a lot of learning on the job. It's a lot of being creative, um, but also curious too. Like product hunt was not the first experiment I did. I've done many different experiments and learned along the way um, doing those, whether I know it or not. So I think it's sort of having the right frame of mind and, and being open to experimentation and curiosity. Uh, and continually doing that over time that you'll you'll learn things without realizing it. Yeah, I agree. I think, it, like you're saying, experimentation and just kind of having the uh, the the frame of mind to just take action and you know try things out and you know see where they go. I think that's an important way to a get a job as a product manager and b to be successful in product management. Or you know when you decide to move on from there and start your own company, it's a it's a definitely a mindset that is I think important to have. Um, so you know, thank, thanks yeah. so much for your time, Ryan. I think that you know you provide a lot of great information and actionable tips for anybody that. That's either just starting out in their product management career or, or you know, beginning the process. So you um, you have a blog, uh, RyanHoover.me. Is there any other ways that folks can kind of reach out to you or follow your your story? Yeah, yeah. Hit me up on I'm R.R. Hoover, and I am all the time. So <laughs> if, you, if you follow me, you'll probably see me multiple times per day. Yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse.